Today, I really want to talk about avoidant and anxious relationship struggles and how you can spot the trap. And this is really circling around a romantic circumstance that demonstrates itself typically in one of two conditions. One partner always feels as though they are chasing down the other who seems to need to keep a certain amount of space and physical and emotional distance between themselves and their partner. Now, in the second condition, one person chases in this way until the other turns around and starts to reciprocate a little bit. And then they start to doubt everything and somehow they become the runner instead. So rather than always going in one direction, suddenly someone is like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I really want to be chasing this person anymore because now they're willing to be caught. And then we start going in the other direction, right? Back and forth, back and forth. And this cycle is what brain researcher Helen Fisher calls frustration attraction. So this is when our brain's reward centers are lit up whenever we receive intermittent and unpredictable reinforcement. So in other words, the sporadic and the intense attention from an unpredictable partner turns us into basically gamblers at a slot machine. It affects neurochemicals such as adrenaline, dopamine, oxytocin, and serotonin, to name a few. And those are chemicals that significantly, significantly impact our behaviors, especially the limbic part of our brain, which is associated with attachment experiences. And so just to give you a little bit of a recap, those six signs that I mentioned in the other video is you experience an emotional token economy in the relationship. You experience stable instability. There's a lot of pointless fighting. You feel as if you are perceived as the enemy in the relationship and or you start to perceive your partner as the enemy. You feel trapped and you start to experience what's called the roller coaster effect. Now, again, if you want to learn more about that, I invite you to check out my video called Six Signs of the Anxious Avoidant Trap. I'd go a lot more in depth with these. Now, a lot of research on insecure attachment typically points towards maladjustment in childhood as the cause of insecure attachment in adulthood or some kind of significant trauma or tragedy that compels you towards this push-pull dynamic in love, which is qualified by having anxious and avoidant tendencies when it comes to intimacy. And yes, all of that is true. But the point that I really want to make here today is that you don't need to have experienced such significant trauma or attachment disruptions in your past. There are plenty of folks that we might qualify as generally secure who will lean in one direction or the other when they're under duress in love. So to help you understand what that might look like today, my goal is to offer you a basic example so that you might be able to spot that kind of trap before you fall into it. Now, before we get into that, um, if you are new to my channel, welcome. My name is Brianna McWilliam, and I am a licensed and board certified creative arts therapist, author, and educator with over 14 years in the field. And it is my mission to help insecurely attached individuals go from self-doubting to self-sovereign and calling in those soul-shaking, passionate partnerships that they want without having to talk in circles around their feelings for hours or even years on end with no tangible result. And I do this using the McWilliam method, which fosters expanding consciousness and secure attachment using three practical tools. And that is cognitive reframing, body activation, and arts-based experiential. The point of which is to finally bring all that insight into action so that you start to experience felt changes in your experience. And so today we are going to be delving into cognitive reframing to help you reframe the story. So make sure you are subscribed and ring the bell for notifications because I put up, put out videos on Mondays and Thursdays and I often pop in for live stream Q and A's and I wouldn't want you to miss out. Now to contextualize the example that I am about to offer you here today, if you don't know already, attachment styles are four unique blueprints for how we have learned to give and receive love in childhood, but also through our adult romantic relationships. And so this blueprint is often a good indicator of how much closeness or space you usually desire when it comes to emotional intimacy. So individuals that typically want a lot of closeness with a partner have what's called an anxious attachment, and I call them open hearts. Individuals who typically want more space usually have what's called an avoidant attachment, and I call them rolling stones. Individuals that both want and fear closeness 
are sometimes considered fearful, avoidant, or disorganized. And I refer to these individuals as spice of lifers. And individuals who are comfortable with both closeness and separateness in relationships and can flexibly move back and forth between those two, two states of being, they're considered securely attached, and I refer to them as cornerstones. Now, while initially it really helps us to learn categories like this because we can start to draw lines around behavior and we can understand more comprehensively why people feel and act the way that they do, it's also really important to realize that these are tendencies that are dimensional and we can often polarize each other on one end of the spectrum or the other based on the energetic momentum that we've got tied up in the groove that we have been carving for ourselves with our thoughts, our feelings, our behaviors, and our beliefs about the world and the possibilities for love in it. So in other words, I want you to think of these styles as existing along the same continuum and as being on one end or the other or somewhere in between. And that is because whether we are talking about the rejection of love or an endless pursuit of love or a bone deep confusion about what your relationship is to love anyway, we are still talking about the same thing and that is love. And so all of us experience all of these tendencies to various degrees. And those folks that feel particularly, let's say, tortured or hopeless, however, are usually finding themselves caught in a loop and they're unable to stop themselves from carving a very deep and painful groove by virtue of just hanging out on one end of the stick more often than not. So this is where I wanna dive into an example of how these tendencies can play themselves out and not necessarily in a very dramatic or traumatic way, but they still exist on a subtle level. And I think it's useful to see and understand it this way because perhaps that will allow you to start to understand the dimensionality of it. So for example, I wanna introduce Joe and I'm gonna call Joe an open heart. So someone who has a more anxious attachment style or let's just say anxious tendencies. And we have Amy and Amy's gonna be a rolling stone, someone who has a more avoidant tendency when confronting stress or conflict in a relationship. Now let's say Joe and Amy, they are in a committed relationship because even though someone may have an avoidant attachment style, they can still commit. But what we're talking about is the subtleties of the way we express these traits, okay? So let's just accept Joe has more anxious tendencies, Amy has more avoidant tendencies, and yet they are in a committed relationship together. And right now they're trying to decide on where they would like to vacation together. But they can't seem to agree on a location. They don't know what activities they'll do when they get there. And they can't quite agree on how their budget should be distributed. So Joe is a lot more interested in things like physical activities or events like hiking or yoga or zip lining, whereas Amy would rather kind of wander the less traveled path. She wants to check out the local areas with no particular plan in mind. Maybe she'll, you know, go to a cafe or lay on the beach and read a good book and just absorb the atmosphere. In a previous job, let's say Joe was a travel agent and he feels like he has a lot of experience and advice to contribute to this decision and what makes for a great vacation. So in a bit of a short, annoyed manner, he expresses that since this is his area of expertise, then Amy should just trust him and defer to his decision on it. And so Amy, hearing the kind of mounting frustration in Joe's tone of voice, she feels a little bit pricked. And so she backs down in order to avoid an argument. And so although it seems as if they have finally come to an arrangement, neither one actually feels too happy about it. Amy feels deflated and she seems to have lost her interest in the upcoming trip, which was supposed to rekindle the romance. And Joe has a jittery feeling in his stomach that tells him that he bullied Amy into what he wanted. And now the vacation is at risk of becoming a complete disaster. So Joe, now noticing Amy's low mood, his anxiety starts to build and he starts insistently checking in with Amy, asking her, is she really okay with the final decision? Now, Amy starts to feel angry and increasingly bullied by Joe. He got what he wanted and he wasn't so concerned about her feelings before. So why doesn't he just shut up about it already? And so to avoid blowing, blowing up and or ruining the entire trip before it has begun, Amy decides to stuff her feelings down even deeper. 
and she offers remote reassurances. She switches into what I'm gonna call performance mode, which is a form of rationalization and intellectualization as a defense. And if you wanna learn more about that, I invite you to check out my video on the topic on canon avoidant partner change. Now to throw Jo off the scent of her mounting irritation, and in order to avoid a conflict, Amy starts to build a case outwardly for why Joe's decision is in fact the logical one to make after all, and she dismisses her own earlier feelings to the contrary. So all emotion seems to have gone from her tone of voice, however, and Joe is left feeling kind of confused, patronized, and unsure of how Amy is actually feeling. And so eventually he gives up because he can't really contend with Amy's logic and her apparent agreeableness, but he can feel Amy emotionally distancing herself from him. And that makes his anxiety start to quietly simmer and accumulate in the background. And so you'll notice with this couple that there are certain coping skills that each one has developed to maintain some kind of equilibrium in the relationship, and yet these are the very skills that are now threatening to dismantle it. So when Joe is upset, he tries to convince Amy to agree with him, to see things his way, because when she doesn't, it feels like an intolerable distance between them. It feels like he does, she doesn't trust him. And if Amy still doesn't see things his way after this insistence, he shifts to becoming increasingly demanding and confrontational in response to his feeling increasingly anxious and need for reassurance. In essence, insistence is the only way that Joe knows how to close the gap between them. And this insistence is really a form of what's called protest behavior. And that is an activating strategy of an open heart to try to reestablish connection. Now in my own vernacular, what I call the surface structure communication, which is a defensive structure communication, it comes across as bullying. And so Amy hears him as saying things like, you don't care about me, you don't listen to me, what's your problem anyway? Can't you see my way is the best way? If you really loved me and understood me, you would do what I ask, okay? But the deep structure communication is usually something more like, please don't abandon me, this feels too lonely, this feels like separateness, and if you understood where I was coming from, I know you would agree with me, and because you don't, it makes me feel lost and unseen, and like I don't matter to you, and I need you to be here with me right now because I need to feel connected to you. So, you know, often we might ask ourselves, well, why don't we just approach each other on a deep structure level? Why do we have to get caught up in defensive posturing to begin with? Well, because early on, People like Joe learn that if you don't want to get hurt, you don't wear your heart on your sleeve. You don't come across too needy. You don't, don't be too intense. Don't reveal too much of what is going on underneath or they will leave or abandon you or experience you as some kind of burden and their love will be withdrawn in some fashion. In other words, you experience love as conditional. Also, it takes a lot of practice and mindfulness and self-awareness to understand and discerningly contextualize whatever that anxious, jittery feeling in your stomach is telling you, and be able to put it into words in the moment rather than instantly responding with a defensive coping skill that has been modeled for you since birth. Now, Amy, on the other hand, is very uncomfortable when there are disagreements in a relationship. And so fears about abandonment are stirred for her around not pleasing Joe well enough and potentially ruining the relationship as a result. So when conflicts arise, she implements her deactivating strategies, which are intended to increase the distance between her and a partner so as to avoid the feelings that stimulate conflict. And that is her way of preserving the relationship. So in this instance, withdrawal, is the way that a Rolling Stones protest, the way that they protest conflict and disharmony in the relationship. And so partners who tend towards shutting down emotionally, they have learned that through things like reasoning, defending, minimizing, dismissing, placating, accommodating, appeasing, criticizing, clamming up, or even using humor as a defense, they can reduce conflict and anxiety in a relationship. And they may also be protecting themselves from that sense of threat and distress that they feel in a conf conflictual situation. So for example, Joe dismissed Amy's thoughts and feelings about their vacation from the get-go. And that probably wounded Amy on a very deep level, which she didn't want to share. But once Joe realized his error, 
because Joe is very perceptive and able to pick up on nonverbal cues, as are most people who have anxious attachment. And he realized his error, error, even though Amy did not voice it aloud, right? Once he realized his error, Amy withheld any opportunity for him to make it right. Because that would basically be giving him another chance to hurt her again in her perspective. And so his increasing insistence actually costs him her trust in this circumstance. And so Rolling Stones may appear as if they don't care, but research indicates that beneath that cool exterior, avoidant partners often experience significant physical discomfort in a conflict or during a difficult conversation. So neuroscientific research tells us that the neocortex of avoidant individuals actually works super hard to suppress emotional cues in their brain and in their bodies. And that is downright exhausting. And it can lead to uncontrollable emotional outbursts when their thinking brain, their neocortex, is distracted with something else. There are also some studies that measure skin conductance and heart rate. And those two indicate that sometimes avoidant individuals experience anxiety at actually higher levels than their anxious partners do under duress. If a rolling stone like Amy could tune in to what's truly bothering her in the moment, it might sound something like, this fighting is making me nervous and it feels like you're accusing me of falling down on the job. And I wish you could see that I'm trying to keep the peace and avoid being over emotional so that we can fix this rationally because I care and I want to be fair to both of us. But you keep steamrolling over me and it makes me not want to be around you. Now, if an open heart like Joe could tune into what's really bothering him in the moment, it might sound something like, I feel like I'm walking on eggshells around you and I can't make a mistake because you'll never forgive me for it. So I feel like I have to watch every word I say and every move I make for fear that you'll abandon me and not telling me how to make it right. And that makes it hard for me to trust our connection is solid. So I start acting in increasingly insecure ways because I'm trying to get reassurance from you. So these conflict cycles can also change depending on the dimension of experience. So for example, Joe might be more pursuant when it comes to sexual and emotional intimacy Whereas Amy might be more insistent when it comes to budgeting, project planning, and maintaining their schedules. So attachment experts tend to assert that the key to assessing your relationship style and the compatibility between you and a partner, it really means that you need to become increasingly cognizant about what triggers you and your partner in your, in your relationship on a primary level and on a secondary level. And also taking a look at the context in which you experience these conflicts right? And if you can start to speak from what I call a deep structure place, which we just demonstrated in those examples, you can start to avoid the defensive and destructive conflicts that may result. Remembering that not all conflict is destructive, some conflict is constructive, but it is constructive when you are approaching it from a deep structure place. Now, if you liked this discussion here today and you want to hear more of it, I invite you to like, subscribe, and again, leave a comment and ring the bell for notifications. As a reminder, I release videos on Mondays and Thursdays, and I often pop in for a live stream Q&A here and there. And if you want to learn, out, learn more, you can check out the caption of this video. I usually offer a quiz to help individuals attach their attach, or assess their attachment styles, and there's also a link to my website and online courses. You can also follow me on Instagram if you want some shareable memes on the topic. Thank you so much for joining me here today.